another series of interviews. It'll be conducted in St. George, Utah, near here, with people that used to live in this valley. Well, I've known that when I was growing up in Mesquite and Bunkerville as Larky Abbott. I am the youngest son of Myron Abbott and Annie Burgess. Um, I was born and raised in Mesquite, born on April the 28th, 1920, and spent most of my life in Mesquite. Uh, I went to school there and left in about 1936, and I have fond memories of the Virgin River and uh, the floods and uh, putting the dam back in to get the irrigation water. I have great memories of the people who are so wonderful. And the interesting thing is that everybody who was our uncle and aunt, we didn't know them by any other name, it was Uncle Will or Uncle Jim or Uncle Charles or Aunt Aurilla or Aunt Myrtle or Aunt Mary Jane. Everybody was aunts and uncles. And that made it so wonderful because even if they weren't, you had that respect and, and, and uh, uh, admiration for all of them. And I remember the, uh, the old uh, dance hall, which was uh, just a block north of where the curve is by uh, where the Abbott Hotel was. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jack Hardy had some apartments there and he had a, a dance hall up on top. And so it was my pleasure as a young kid to take my two-piece band that was Joanne Abbott who played the piano and I played the clarinet and saxophone, and we played for dances up there, and it was the only dance hall, really, that we had. And it was so great, and it was such great fun. And when I met uh, Mr. Montgomery, who's the director of the museum, and we were talking about the old uh, times in Mesquite and Bunkerville, he uh, had some pictures he wanted me to identify, and I just couldn't come up with some of the names. But then I happened to remember my beautiful cousin, Barbara Sherritt, who is now going to be 100 years old, even as we speak, practically, and has a great memory of all the things that happened in those two beautiful towns that we remember so well. And so I've asked Mr. Montgomery to come and speak to Barbara and have her identify and tell some of the things that she remembers about the, these two townships. And this is Barbara, my wonderful cousin. Thank you. It's a very high pleasure to meet some of the people from Mesquite who still have an interest in it. I go back a long ways. My father bought a, a 20 acres from Isomer Spag in 1911, and we moved there in ni September of 1911. And then, of course, I remember uh, the hardships that everyone went through trying to establish a, a good little town in Mesquite because it was known as Mesquite Flats then. And then um, I remember there was only one building where all the me meetings were held and it was on the south side of the street and it was what we called uptown because we, we lived in what they called Stringtown because we lived along the road between Bunkerville and Mesquite. Uh, so then, uh, Pidge Barnum and Aunt Emma Abbott, and um, I can't remember right quickly uh, who the violinist was, but I know that Pidge Barnum played his little accordion, and Emma played the little reed organ, and those were, they played for the dance. And I can remember seeing the grown ups dancing, the quadrilles and the shoddish and all of those old-fashioned dances while I laid on the bench and watched them. And then uh, uh, time went on, and of course I got to go to school, which was a highlight. My mother wouldn't let me go to school until I was seven years old, but I didn't become seven until too late to get in that the school that year, so I had to wait till I was almost eight. And Aunt Emma Abbott was my first teacher. And we met in the old red schoolhouse that was built in about 1910. And uh, <clears throat> I remember the catty corner across the street, Will and Mamie Hughes lived. 
And then the tithing office was right straight across the street west for the, uh, from the school building. And the old meeting house of which I'm talking is, uh, was directly south. <coughs> and uh, Jimmy, uh, 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 James Hughes, had the, and Aunt Anne had the, a, a general store that was mm -hmm. up the street, uh, mm -hmm. about a half a block from the schoolhouse. And uh, I remember in 1915, it was badly damaged. Mm -hmm. And we had a, our pictures, there was a photographer came through town, and so Mother decided to have our pictures taken, so I have a copy of those. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, I do remember one time, one Christmas, that my brother Myron and, a, Lee and the Hardy Boys, I think it was Leo, they dis, uh, dissembled an old buggy and put it up on top of the tithing house. And we all, so then Uncle Will was bishop and they made him take it down. Mm -hmm. So that wasn't so much fun for them. Mm -hmm. And. Um, then in 1915, we had the Abbott reunion. Everyone furnished something, and of course, I can remember the good dried corn that was cooked and brought there with the little uh, pork, uh, what we called salt pork, and uh, we had a wonderful time. And then that someone came riding from bunk uh, from um, Littlefield, saying that a flood was coming. So, of course, um, many of the Bunkerville people had to rush home to get ahead of the flood. I mean, they still had to cross the river, and uh, there was no bridge there. So uh, they had to hurry home. And I remember all of us going down and watching the flood come, and it was like a huge mountain rolling down the street. And there was uh, outhouses, chickens, ducks, uh, horses pigs, everything, all, all of the animals. Littlefield was just about washed away at that time, going down the river, and I remember seeing the horses fighting to, to swim, but they didn't have much uh, a chance to get out of that rolling, muddy water. You know, it's kind of hard, Barbara, for us to remember the river being that dangerous, but I remember as a little kid when they'd ring the, <clears throat> ring the school bell, that meant the floods was coming, and everybody rushed. The men all took off, and the kids to go cut brush, and the women could get food. Mm -hmm. And they'd take those big wagons and go up there where the dam was. And I remember they had two kinds of wagons. They had a wagon that was a flatbed, and then they had wagons with racks on the side. And they would load these great big rocks, roll them up planks. I've seen, it seemed to me like three and four men trying to roll up one big stone up the planks onto that wagon. And then they would fill the other wagons with brush. And then they'd take those teams out into the raging water after it got down where they thought it was safe. And they'd take the rock wagons out first and string them across where the dam was. And then they'd go upstream with the wagons that had the brush. And they'd throw the brush off. And they would float down against the wheels of the wagons with the rock. And then they'd roll the rock off onto the brush, and that's the way they put the dam back in to get us through. I remember one team uh, drowning while I was up there as a kid, and I never will forget the sound of those horses as they were drowning. So it was a horrible time, wasn't it? Yes, and then that river was a was a monster. It was. I, I remember we were I went to, had to go to Bunkerville for something, and the folks thought the water had gone down enough, but when the quicksand was the worst oh, thing yeah. they had to, yeah. to deal with. And we started out and the horses were doing going fine and all of a sudden they were swimming and pulling the buggy. We had, had a white top buggy at that time. And I remember I was so scared. And uh, 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 Richard and I were in the back seat and we were holding on to the uh, top ribs of the buggy and so that we wouldn't the water was running through the buggy, of course, and we were up there on the seat. And we, my dad finally brought, him, brought the team up and found a place where he could bring it up out of the river. And then we had to go back and 
go on to bunker bill. But it was dangerous. Can oh, it's, you it, it's hard to visualize that the water would go from bank to bank and up over the bridge after they put the bridge in. Would even go over the top of that bridge. But it was. Uh, it's always been a dangerous. Uh, here, right here in uh, uh, the Christmas of 88, 1988 and 89, there was a huge flood that went down here. So it was a very dangerous river because it brought debris from the upper parts of this country. And you remember, Barbara, you mentioned Uncle Will, he had a big hotel there on the yeah, corner on the of the street. And I remember as a kid that the, I don't know where the doctor came from, but I know he showed up in a little Surrey, you know, a little one horse Surrey that thing. Was with it Dr. Middleton. Was it really from, from up here? Uh, yes. You know, that he's the one that operated on my foot? Well, he was a wonderful old doctor. He was a tall man, yeah. but so kind. And I remember he, they, he came down to my, to see about my mother, she had uh, she has swollen her face and everything was so swollen, distorted. And but he came and he took care of her. And she got and the the pay I'll never forget. They uh, sent Hortense and me out to get a couple or three chickens, and that was his pay. <laughs> well, I remember but Uncle Will's house. The reason I remembered that is because he came to town. And they gathered all the kids together that had tonsillitis. Yeah. And they operated on us on the dining room table in right. Uncle Will's house. And that's the first time I ever had ether, and I've never had it since, but it was terrible. But it was like an assembly line. They, they took one to. at a time and cut them out, and next one. <laughs> uh, I remember one time during the flood, or I mean the flu, uh, during the war, <coughs> um, we had a teacher, we had two men come to us. We were out in front of our house and uh, along the lot. <clears throat> it was getting kind of evening, and they said, uh, one of the men called out and he said, uh, uh, Do you, could you tell us where we might find a place to stay for the night? And my mother said, well, you, they have the schoolhouse. They have it open for tourists. You just pass through town. And, he, and in a very funny little voice, he says, well, if we'd have wanted to stay there, we'd have stopped in the first place, but we, we didn't want to take the chance of getting the flu. Mm -hmm. So Mother said, well, I, I, we have very humble conditions here at the place, but if you want to put up with that, why, you're welcome to stay. So then they stayed. Of course, we all had to shift beds in order to make room for him. For them, and the next morning uh, they left. Mother fixed breakfast for them, and they left. And beside each plate was the fifty cent piece. So uh, the only th uh, one I could remember was the one with the funny little voice, and she said his name was Golden Kim J. Golden Kimball. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. But um, <coughs> during the World War One. Um, it was terrible. It was just awful. And we were, uh, we had to, after the binders had gone and, and, and done, put the, sh the grain in the sheaves, then uh, we had to go around with sickles and um, gather the grain and we had to uh, thresh it. And the way we had of threshing it was putting it between two tarpaulins mm. and then we'd whip it with shillelaghs until we could get it out of the worst of the stems. And then we would have a big box with the window screen on it, and two of us would get it, and we'd shake it until the chaff would go through the window screen. And then we'd put that wheat in little uh, buckets and things that they furnished for us. And then the men would come around and pick up that wheat. And that they would take it, and they had the silos somewhere near there. I don't know where, just where it was. But that was the wheat that they sent to Germany after the, um, the war was over. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the president was, uh, I think it was Woodrow Wilson. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, uh, and of course the representative that was talking to our church representatives said, well just where are you going to get that wheat?
And he said, well, we have it. And he said, uh, where are you keeping it? He said, in silos. And they said, no, 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 it's all mildewed now. And uh, our representative said, no, it isn't. So uh, he said, well, if you can furnish the wheat, we'll furnish the transportation. So that's the way it was sent. But the worst thing during the war that I remember, we had to save peat pit, uh, peach pits and plum and apricot pits uh, in a, a separate place, you know. We, the peach pits went in here in one can and the others went in another. And that was what they made poison gas out of because Germany was already gassing our boys. Mm -hmm. So they, they had to hurry and get this going to retaliate. But uh, I remember that very well. Mm. And I can remember when the war was over, I was out at the wood pile, getting, picking up chips, and this, the man came r along on a horseback and he stopped, hesitated at our gate, and he said, the war is over, the war is over. So I ran to the ho in the house, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, told the folks, and they said, "Oh no, you're just having a pipe dream." And I said, and then pretty soon it was established that other people were cheering, and and they were, it was just so wonderful to have that war over. Do you remember the the first airplane you saw? Yes, by Hancock went to Las Vegas and chartered it and brought it to Mesquite and it landed in the alfalfa fields on the south side of the street and I don't remember just whose field it was but um, I know he came and said to me would you like to go up in the airplane and I said well yes but my mother I know couldn't afford it because it cost five dollars and uh, she said I didn't say anything about the price, I want to know if you'd like to go up. And I said, yes. So he said, well, go get your sister, Cleora. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we went up. They put big helmets on us and uh, goggles and, and a huge coat. And it was a two-seated, cock had cock open cockpits. We were in the front cockpit. And they, he was in the back. He said, are you afraid of heights? And we said, no. So he just went up and, and over and <laughs> did a somersault, and, but it, it was so exciting. We didn't, we weren't a bit afraid. I never did get a chance to fly that that early, but I remember the an old uh, uh, Fokker, I think it was from World War II, landed in uh, Uncle Charles and Aunt Orilla's plowed field there, <clears throat> which would have been on the east side of Mesquite, where they lived and it was beyond them. <clears throat> Big wood, cottonwood trees all around this farm and he landed there. And Denzel and I couldn't wait to get to the plane, you know, to see it because we were really fascinated. And when we got there, the guys, the pilot got out of the deal and said, <clears throat> you know where I can get some gas? And said, yes, there was a service station up there where there's old gas. And he said, well, if you could get this uh, five gallon can of gas, I'll take you for a free ride. So I took the gas can, went down and got the gas and come back and he took, he took Denzel for the flight. I stayed there, but I got the gas. <laughs> but that was I, a dirty I deal. I always was mesmerized by that. And I remember, you remember when the Western Airlines used to fly over there, the old uh, mail pilots, the old uh, two wing planes they used to have, and one of them crashed up here and they never could find the pilot. And I forget his name. His name Murphy. was on it. I think it was Murphy. Could have been, but it was a long time. And then I remember one of them went down up there on uh, the Arizona Strip, going up over the hill. Mm -hmm. And Uncle Arthur and uh, uh, I mean Uncle Charles and Aunt Orilla, their family took a flatbed wagon, and we went up there. All a lot of us went up there and lifted that plane up on a wagon and had to bring it back down to Mesquite. And then I don't know what happened to it after that. Well, this was what the the plane I went up is what they called a, a Jenny. Jenny, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. So uh, it was, but the first one I ever heard, uh, the teacher was from Florida. Her name was uh, Mrs. Mrs. Bergstrom, mm -hmm. and she said, uh, "Oh, there's a plane coming over." She, we just thought it was something roaring. 
<clears throat> so she said, run out quickly and we'll watch it go over. So it looked like a bird hawk up in the air, but we, she'd say, now listen carefully and you can hear the up and lower mm -hmm. tones of that plane. And we thought that was the most fantastic mm -hmm. thing we'd ever seen. But I'll tell you, the first car I ever saw was the most frightening thing I, I ever had in my life, I believe. Richard and I were going down the street. Mother had sent us down to John Jensen's place, which was the next, just below us, our farm. And we heard this, we had just got started down the road. It was just a one road winding through the mesquite clumps. So we heard this horrible noise. We thought it was thunder. And we stopped and listened, but the, the sky was clear. But it kept coming, mm, mm, mm. And we just, could, we were just scared to death. And here, all of a sudden, out behind a huge clump of mesquite brush, that was that huge animal coming right toward us. And we ran as fast as we could. We jumped the ditch, the irrigation ditch, but we didn't have much luck getting through the barbed wire fence. So when we got through, of course, we were screaming, and the blood was running down both of us because the barbed wire fence had lacerated our faces and the head, and, and the, car, the folks came running out. They thought we were being butchered or something, and so we stood there and watched it go, boom, you know, through the deep sand. And uh, so then Mother said, oh, I believe that's a car. <laughs> because it was pictured in the Country Gentleman magazine. <laughs> so we stood there and watched it mm, 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 all the way until it got around and all, almost over to Grandma Abbott's old place. Uh, the Frainers lived there uh, after Grandma died in 1917. I'll never forget her dying. She had typhoid. Do you remember the first movie you ever saw? Yes, we stood on the bank of uh, Edgar Levitt's ditch, and uh, they, they cast the, the uh, a show on uh, the garage. It was whitewashed, you know, with lime, and we stood on the ditch and watched it being performed, and it was one of Fatty Arbuckle, and it was hilarious. Of course, we thought it was, and uh, it, that was, the I remember when uh, they used to show movies there in Mesquite on uh, the old garage, <clears throat> the Hughes garage, you remember that was there by uh, it was the, right. the, the store, Elmer's store. Elmer and them had the store in the post office and then the side of it was the, it was the garage. Was that on the main street? Yeah, right uh, on the main street. Uh, this uh, <clears throat> episode, uh, Edgar Levitt lived one block up uh, above the main street. Oh, okay. And that's where, and then it was, there was a garage right across the street, uh -huh. but I don't remember. I thought it was the Hardy garage. Uh, it, it doesn't matter. It, we, yeah. we both have the same memory. But I remember there were <laughs> silent ones that I first saw. Uh -huh. And that Mary Jane used to get so excited with those movies with uh, Tom Mix and them chasing each other around the rock with their guns. And she would stand up and holler, watch out, watch out. <laughs> it was so fun. And then later on, uh, Howard, uh, not, yeah, not Howard, Jim, uh, James Hughes, Elmer, Elmer Hughes, got so involved in, in uh, the movies and stuff that he, uh, he and Howard built a theater. Oh. And uh, I named the theater for him. It was Elwood, the Elwood Theater, uh -huh. with E.L. from Elmer and W.A.R.D. from Howard's name. Howard Pulsifer. And, uh, and uh, I became the projectionist. <laughs> My sister Shirley was the usher. <laughs> we had a great time there, that, that little old building, but there were so many memories of the movies and things that I just, that was our only entertainment. I couldn't really wait for Saturday to roll around because that was, that was movie night. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Weren't they great memories, Barbara? They were wonderful. I remember one of the first um, the Tom Mix shows I saw was, uh, you know, they, they just, ran the horses and I was sitting by someone and I don't remember, it, he was a stranger in town and um, he said, uh, I said, well if they don't st uh, stop those horses they're going to be winded if they don't do that more often than they're doing it. 
And he said, well, oh, don't worry about their horses. They only run for about five minutes at a time. <laughs> <coughs> I can remember that good smell that was always in uh, Jimmy Hughes's uh, store, general store. Boy, it was, you smelled the tobacco and... <laughs> The coffees, and <laughs> yeah, my heavens. But I, one of the things that I remember the most is we didn't have any money and everything was bordered. I remember gathering the eggs for mother to go down to Elmer's store to get some flour or sugar or rings for bottling or whatever, and I traded the eggs in. And even when I went to the movie, I could take three eggs and that would let me into the movie. And Elmer would take those down to Las Vegas and trade them in for stuff to stock his store. It was interesting how we survived without any well, uh, money to speak of. We, uh, we didn't know what, what it looked like. I remember <clears throat> my folks used to raise turkeys. So uh, before, just a few days before, um, we, they mar took them to Las Vegas to market them. Well, they would have, during the summer, we'd gather little cans to nail around the outside of the wagon box mm -hmm. to put the feed and water in. And then uh, it took them four and a half days to go by team and wagon to Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. So then uh, some of the people wouldn't, um, they didn't know what to do to dress out a turkey. So mother would say, well, if you give me uh, privilege, kitchen privileges, I'll dress, them, dress it out for you. So they, but they had, when the turkeys were all done, well, then they could make more speed coming home. They could come home in a, four days because they didn't have to stop and water and feed and rest the turkeys on the way. But every so often they had to do that. Mm -hmm. So every Thanksgiving and that Christmas, why well, we rounded up the turkeys and, of course they would, they had a two deck wagon then, you know, they'd put the turkeys in the bottom, then they'd put another, a deck on top of that, but there'd be a space between the decks for the turkeys to put their heads out and uh, get the feed and water out of these cans that were nailed around the side of the wagon box. Mm -hmm. So those were good days. Oh, they were great memories. I, you know, it, it's hard for me to drive down the Mesquite anymore from here and go through the narrows down there and be reminded that that's where my dad was killed. Yeah when they were trying to dam off the Virgin River and, and farm all of that Johnson bench. Yeah. And uh, I remember the accident, and, and I brought you a little piece of the paper, we'll run copies off so you can have one, but um, I remember I was herding the cows down on the, the river mm -hmm. when Shirley came, or not Shirley, Millie came to tell me that Daddy was killed. I'll and I looked, you know, and I remember I laughed. I thought she was pulling my leg, you know. Daddy was killed and everything. She kept saying, no, no, crying. And then when we, when we come back up to the house, I remember seeing my mom sitting in a rocking chair on the porch, absolutely yeah, out of it. I mean, her eyes were set and she just sat there staring. I'll never forget that as long as I live. And then the funeral, because dad was crushed, uh, wasn't a full casket as like most caskets would be and I was a little kid I was eight years old and they had baptized me Saturday and he was killed Monday so I had a lot of frustrations right then but I remember looking in the in the casket and at that moment on I have never actually looked at anybody if I had to it's it was such a defeating thing to see my dad, who I thought was the most gigantic, strong man I'd ever known in my life, with absolutely hardly anything. And they had his caskets surrounded with white oleanders. I have never had a oleander in my home since, and the smell it lives with me to this day. I cannot stand it, just to smell that white oleander. And yet that's all they had. Yeah, That's all they had was those oleanders. Mm -hmm. And I remember later, though, as I got older, when I was about 10 or so, Uncle Walt Hughes, I think he lived across the street from Elmer and them, he made all the caskets. I remember every time I go by, he was making a 
casket for a little kid or a, you know, he seemed like he did everything. But we used to put ice, go to Bunkerville to the ice house and get those big hundred pound cakes of ice, break them up, fill up Court George, and they'd line the dead body with those while they were, because we didn't have any, any way to keep bodies back in those days. When Grandma died, um, her boys, I don't know which ones, Nathan or whether it was, uh, just which ones, but they went to middle, uh, up to middle, up uh, on the Bunkerville Mountains, and they got snow and brought down in seamless sacks and put in court jar, two court jars and put around Grandma because yes. she had swollen so badly. But to, the lumber that they made her, her casket out of came from our place. It was, we had it in the loft of the tent we were living in, and that was to bend my mother's cabinet. Mm -hmm. So Dad said, well, we'll make it after we, uh, it was uh, yellow pine, and it was up and brought down from Paraguna. So I remember Uncle Dave and Uncle, I think it was, let's see, Uncle Dave I know was one of them, and I think Uncle Nathan was the other one that came and they said, uh, John, uh, we can't get lumber wide enough to make Ma's coffin, so would you consider letting us have those 18-inch boards that you have in your, mm -hmm. above your, in your tent, and uh, my dad looked at my mother and he said, well, it's uh, your mother and it's your cupboard that I was going to make out of those boards. So he said, it'll be up to you to make the decision. So the boards came down and that was what they made mm -hmm. Grandma's See, casket mm, out of. Amazing. But what memories, Marva? Well, you know, we didn't have our minds all cluttered up with crud mm -hmm. like we have now. And everything we experienced in those days, they were indelibly printed on our minds. And I can remember Aunt Emma Abbott, she used to drive a little one-horse buggy, and her old stallion horse was Bert that she drove. And she lived uh, uh, west of the Little Wash. We had two washes, the Little Wash and then the Big Wash up near a town. And so, and, she, and every morning she would... Uh, the wash here, the river here. This was the town wash, it had all the old... Do you know where that is? Is this a big wash? Well, it, they got it marked as a town wash. Do you recognize any of these people, their homes? Yeah, I remember Hiram Burgess. Uh -huh. And I remember... Uh, no, Jess Wait never lived in Bunkerville, in Mesquite. No, this could be down on the end. They've got Louis Pulsford up here, the Pulsfords. Lou Pulsford. Do you know where the Oasis uh, uh, place is now? Oh, yeah. That was our place. Um, and then uh, you went down to the end of our field, and then you went up to a, across a lane west. You'd only go uh, to the end of our field south, and then you'd turn and go west to uh, Daddy Pulsifer's place, and then you went a short distance, and uh, now Lou Pulsifer lived in Daddy Pulsifer's old place oh, okay. Okay. for okay. quite a few years, yeah. when he was uh, had the school contract, and Vi Hancock used to drive the school bus for him. See, this is here road to Bunkerville. Let's turn it around this way. This is the road to Bunkerville. Yeah. Does that help any? Oh, yes. Um, let's see. Well, this was our place right uh -huh. here. Uh -huh. And then uh, we went, we just went down. Let's see, this is where the road went over the Bunkerville. Oh, wait a minute, then. No, wait a minute. This was in our place. Yeah, yeah. Um, this was our place right here. Because uh, when, uh, no, this was Grandma's place. Okay. This is, uh, your dad was farming this place, yeah, was when Grandma's, when he let the the water <laughs> flood our tent. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I, he didn't let it, he, it just <laughs> happened. But Dad was sure mad, because it ruined everything we had. Well, sure. 
but we uh, this was up toward Bunkerville, and then you made a left turn and went down here. Yeah. And then Daddy Pulsifer was uh, over here. Uh huh. And then you made a short turn and you went down to the field where Lou Pulsifer lived, and he had a farm down there. And. Um, no, that makes sense. This was Grandma's place. This yeah. is what Art Hughes used to farm for. Oh, uh -huh. there. Oh, I got you. This is all was all Grandma's at one time, uh -huh. and here was where Uncle Dave and Aunt Emma lived. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Just uh, below yeah. the wash. Oh my heavens! And Grandma lived you know, somewhere along in here. Yeah. It, oh, that's she had a brick house. Did she? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, that's great. Well, Barbara, that it's been so wonderful visiting with you oh, and hearing of all of these things. I have fond recollections, but you just filled in all the blanks. Well, it was a, a great time for me. Malaria was so bad, and the mosquitoes were so bad that we used to have to take an old dish pan or an old something, uh, whatever we had. We'd put manure and hay in it and set it on fire to battle the mosquitoes. And we'd rather smell the horrible odor of the the smudge pots, we called them, than have to fight the mosquitoes all night. Because we had to sleep outside in those days. We didn't, we didn't sleep in, we couldn't sleep inside because it was just too hot. And the nights never cooled off. So, uh, that then uh, they called it chills and fever a lot, and most everyone would get down during the summer with chills and fever. Mm -hmm. But I, I was one I couldn't get over it. So someone su said that I was it was ruining my heart. So Mother had her ship me out. So I, I went to Las Vegas, and I couldn't stand the heat. So I went on to California, and I lived there the rest of, till 1980. January of 1991, and I came up here. I, I remarried, but uh, uh, I, in the meantime, I did a lot of traveling too. Okay, and as we conclude, let's review again your family history. Tell us when you were born and your parents' names, and if you remember when they were born. Okay. okay. We can finish. Them. My father was born in England, Southport, Lancashire, England in 1872 and they came to America he and his uh, with his he came to America with his family Samuel Peckett Horsley and Sarah Barrows Horsley and they settled first in St. John in U uh, Utah and then they moved on to Paraguna Utah my mother was born in Bunkerville in 1879 when the United Order was going and then uh, uh, my father, when he was a young man, was visiting his Aunt Rose Ann Gubler in Santa Clara, and she was marrying, she, my mother was visiting Lorenzo Levitt in Santa Clara, and they met and got married. And they moved to Paraguna, and that's where I was born. And <clears throat> I was born there in uh, November 14, 1908, but I had two brothers and two sisters older. Myron was born in 1898, Cleora 1900, and, and uh, Ezra was born in 1902, Hortense in 1904, and then I said how, and, and Richard was born in 1911, Lucina in 1914, Evelyn in 1917, and um, Donald was in 1922. Mm -hmm. You know what, Barbara? I can't understand why your mind is so quick and so clear at a hundred when I have hard time remembering what I said yesterday. You're <laughs> unbelievable, and I love you so much and appreciate you and well, all the information you fed me over the years about the last two years that I've known you about my family because I had lost track of a lot of that, and I thank you. Thanks so and much. to f one more time, tell us about your parents and your brothers and sisters, and then we'll finish. Well, I'm pretty sure that, uh, Barbara, you remember my mom and my dad, 
Uh, Mom was a Burgess. She was born and raised up in Pine Valley <clears throat> and came down to Mesquite and uh, met my dad, who was Myron Decatur Abbott. And uh, dad, uh, Mom had a real crush on a guy by the name of Ira Reber from up at uh, Littlefield. And about the time dad got ready to go on his mission, but the, he, she remained uh, free for him to <clears throat> come back. And they, uh, my memories of, of them are almost nil, except where I can remember back to the, the house where we were, where I was raised, and I called it the chicken coop, because yeah. it was a converted chicken coop. And, uh, but I remember the front of, uh, yard of the house was just dirt. But mom had taken a broom and sprinkled it with water and swept that so much that it was like a marble floor. It was the slickest, most beautiful entrance into a house I'd ever seen. And I remember the, we didn't have curtains at all the windows. We had burlap hanging down and separate. But my dad, bless his heart, always saw that we had music. And I remember the first uh, Vic Trouble, I guess, her phonograph we had had the brown discs. They're about six inches long and about Edison, an old yeah, Edison. the old Edison. And I remember he played Caruso. Mm -hmm. Yep. That every morning when I'd get up, I could hear Caruso singing. It was always. And then he, then he later bought the uh, the old Morning Glory phonograph. Remember, it had the big Morning Glory horn on it. But he always kept us kids interested in music, and in uh, in uh, the form and stuff. And I remember just as a side, Barbara, that one day I was down at the corral, and. Uh, there was some mating going on with the animals, and I made some wise crack about it. And I was sitting on the fence, and that's the only time my father ever did anything to me. But he turned around and just tapped me the side of the face and put his finger up to, to his lip, so I knew he shut up. But you know what? He took me down from the fence a little later, walked me slowly out to the garden where the corn was growing. And he gave me the best discussion in my life about what happens, about sex and, and stuff, the about the corn seed. and the corn silk and how the seed. And he spent an hour with me in the garden. I've never forgotten that sermon. It wasn't a, wasn't a rash thing. It was a beautiful discussion so that I understood life and how precious it was and not to make fun or to... Uh, emphasize anything and I have never forgotten that it's li lived with me all my life and, and then the other thing that I remember is showing a hard time about the family is that I was trying to show the kids how great I was as Tom Mix back to the movies you know with a saddle up on the old cottonwood fence the uh, pole, oh, yeah. and the saddle turned and I fell and broke both arms <laughs> and dad wasn't there and my mother grabbed me and took me down through the wash, because we lived in the wash there, uh -huh. you know, across over and up to Uncle Mr. Levitt, who lived across the street, over on the other side of the, the wash, and took me over there, and he had my mom get behind, or sit in the chair, yeah, she sat in the chair, had her put her arms around my chest and hold me tight, and then he pulled my arms out and set the bone, and then he took uh, shingles that they used on the roof of the house mm -hmm. and put around it and wrapped them, both of them, so I had them like this. So my mom had to feed me and do everything for me for I don't know how long. And then when they got ready to come off, and it, she took me over to him, he said, you know, those uh, the flat irons your mother had, they were solid iron, remember, that they used to iron with, just heated on the stove. you got to take one in each hand and I want you to go 50 times around the house one way and then go 50 times around the house the other way carrying those arms. And you do it every day. I've had doctors look at these arms and say, it's unbelievable. So Uncle Lister knew what he was doing. Well, it was, um, I can remember when they were first married and they came and lived in a tent right near us in that area where I showed you Grandma. Mm -hmm. Abbott had it, and where you, your yeah. dad farmed it. And I thought she was the most wonderful person in the world, because 
I, I loved her cabbage. She could cook cabbage better than <laughs> anybody. And so one day she was cooking, it was almost done, and my dad came and called me to go home. And I cried <laughs> all the way because I didn't get to stay and eat cabbage with her. And uh, then I remember when Eel was born, yeah. and he was, he died. I don't remember how old he, he was. He was four years old. But uh, I can remember mother coming, she'd been over there helping your mother, and she said, uh, I'm so sad. She said, uh, Eel's got uh, membranous croup. Now that was her interpretation. And uh, and I don't think he's going to live. And she sat there and cried by the stove. And Dad said, well, you, the, your tears are not going to save him, so you might as well shut up. <laughs> But uh, I remember when he died, it was such yeah. a sad day. Well, he was the oldest of the family, yeah. and I didn't know him at all. And then there was Mill er, Denzel and Millie. Millie was first, and then Denzel, and then uh, Shirley. Yeah. And then me, and then Shirley. Well, after and Denzel was killed, you know, in Mesquite. He was, you remember the old Lynch water gate? Yeah. Well, that's where everybody went swimming, yeah. and th those old water gates. Uh, they used the water master used to go up and take the gate out on on uh, the weekend, so the water would rush out and clear the ditches, and we didn't have to dig dig the ditches so often. And we went up on the twenty fourth of July. Uh, all of us went up, mom and us, and Stan Pulsford was kind of dating mom then at that time, or was a good friend with her, because dad had already been killed for many years. Denzel was then fifteen, fifteen years old, and I was ten at that time. And we went up and Denzel was going to demonstrate his new dive that he had perfected because, you know, he had made all the papers. He had swum the Colorado River where the dam is and everything before he was even 12 years old. So he was known all around as a great swimmer. So he went up on this, this hill there at the Lynch Gate and Mom and us we were sitting down by the, by the hole and he dove. And I'll never forget the sound they hadn't drained the ditch. And he he hit in less than two feet of water. And when he rolled over and come to the surface, he said, my neck is broke. And it was floating and a stand post for jumped in and pulled him out of the, the ditch. And we brought him up to St. George. They couldn't do anything for him back in those days. And so I remember he laid on the cot out under that old palm tree right in front of the house with his dog curled up at his feet. And that's where my brother lived for four days before he died. And uh, it must have been so I had a hard struggle with trying to figure out why my dad was taken, my brother was taken within two years, and they kept telling me that I was loved. You know, the Lord loved me, and I couldn't understand that. If he loved me, why did he do that to me? But you know, you get answers to all those questions as you live. Oh yeah, and it's it's yeah. all questions I never think about. It anymore. comes together sooner it or does. later. It does, and I'm so grateful for that. I remember when we I was living in Whittier, California then, <clears throat> and we got a telegram, which was very rare. My mother sent it to Whittier for us, and she said Marin was killed this morning. Well, that threw us into a tizzy. We called Marin. My brother Marin, Marin S, oh, but yeah. she didn't say anything. She said oh, Marin was killed. So we uh, we got all ready to go to uh, come up to his funeral and everything. We uh, were all working, and uh, we so then uh, we got a, 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 an idea of calling the central in Mesquite to find out which Marin it was. So then she said it was Marin D and oh. not Marin S. Mm, so that, uh, that was a frustrating time. But mm. I think it was May when he was killed. Well, Barbara, love you. Thank you so much. You're wonderful. This is another